Yeah. Well, you said so much that I want to unpack. And first of all, 43 years. Hello. Um, I think anyone who has been married for over two decades, we need to just pull up a chair and listen to everything. <laughs> because as you know, that is a, such a rarity in our culture right now for someone to be married for that long. And so um, I'm just like, pour all of your wisdom out. <laughs> uh, my husband and I have been married for 23 years and I feel like we're just getting started. So, um, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about you you're on a mission to help Christian women, especially to learn how to communicate clearly and confidently. Where did that mission come from? Like, did you just wake up today and say, how can I make a difference in the world? Okay, let's try this. <laughs> no, it started. I still remember the moment that changed everything for me. We were on a date, my husband and I, we were sitting in our farm truck. We were outside our favorite restaurant. We had five children in six years. And my husband, he worked long hours as a farmer. Yeah, you heard that five kids in six years. Yeah, I was I'm yeah. doing the math and thinking, mm -hmm. my my word, your your uterus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's exactly what my uterus said too, by the way. <laughs> but my husband was working long hours as a farmer and I often felt like a single mom. And we were not conflicting well period. Um, we had something that looked like long, cold, silent wars until one of us would blow up and we would end up hurt with each other. And then one night on this particular night, this date night, <laughs> I'd reached the end of my rope. And I said to my husband, I, I said, I can't do this anymore. And I could see the panic in his eyes. And he said to me, what do you mean? You can't do this anymore. And I said, I can't do marriage like this anymore. I said, we just keep hurting each other. We don't resolve anything. I am so hurt and I am so tired. And I poured out this unhappiness to him. The most amazing thing happened. He not only listened, but he shared his pain with me. And, and this was the first time in a long time. And I think I had been so hurt. I hadn't seen his pain. Mm. And But then on this night, we said we recommitted to each other and we said, we're going to get the help that we need in order to get well. And all because of this pivotal conversation, I now do what I do. I work some with married couples, but for the most part, I work with women who are working on their relationships. When they change the steps of the dance, mm. it changes the dance. Their partner, typically a kind partner, he changes the steps too, you know, in difficult relationships or where there's external pressures pressing in on the relationship. That's what was happening to, to happening to us, right? Kids are a bit of an external internal pressure. Oh yeah. And then, yeah. And then challenges at work too, that are pressing in on the relationship. And we didn't have the skills that we needed to communicate effectively what was really going on inside of us, what was happening. It was like life was a blur and we didn't take the time that we needed to have these oh so important, but not so fun conversations to understand one another and what was really happening with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're talking about this pivotal conversation that you have with your spouse, I can't help but think it took a lot of vulnerability, right? For you to say like, this is what's going on in me. And then it took vulnerability on his part as this man to be like, and this is what's going on with me. And I think in a lot of marriages, unfortunately, you'll have one partner who maybe they, they're they courageous enough to be vulnerable. And then that vulnerability is not met with compassion. It's not met with understanding. It's met with defensiveness and accusations or just plain old ignoring. So, Anne, how would you advise a woman if, or a, a partner, maybe it's a man listening, and they're trying to be vulnerable. They're trying to open up their heart. They're trying to build that connection, right? And their spouse doesn't respond like your husband responded. Mm -hmm. And this was a good 15 years into our marriage, Dana. So mm. this was a long time of not communicating vulnerably and not doing it well. And we kind of stumbled on it on this particular night that vulnerability really is the better way. But the way that I spoke to him on this night opened him up instead of closed him down, which I was doing many times before. I did it wrong so many times. But on this particular night, uh, it was a disruptor to say, you know, I can't do marriage like this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think it takes a disruptor when we've been doing it wrong many times. It takes a, it takes something that we say that disrupts our partner enough to say, you know, this is a problem. 
that we need help. We need to work on this. I take responsibility for my part in it. I'm not good at this. I don't know how to do this, but I know we need help. And I think that's a good place to start. The question that I want to ask you, Anne, is how do you define kindness and how has God been kind to you? Oh, my, Dana, what a big <laughs> question. <laughs> Kindness to me is being honest with myself first and being kind to myself. Um, that means recognizing my humanness and recognizing when I'm my, when I'm depleted and I don't like to get to that depleted place, by the way, I like to have a rhythm of rest so that I care for myself so that I can show up as my best self here on the podcast, but especially for my family, yeah. especially for my, my kids and, and my grandchildren, I want to be at my best. So kindness starts with being kind to me. Kindness then can overflow into the people around me. Um, kind words, kind thoughts, I think start with, and then they become kind words and then they become kind actions, you know, mm. but kindness shows up when I know you and I know your vulnerabilities and I know where I can be kind to you, not push those hot buttons on necessarily, um, but have honest conversations that are necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I think that kindness shows up in our thoughts first, and then they become our words and then they become our actions. I think actually love starts in our head, you know, um, practicing the presence of our partner. Um, I have a ring that I wore for many, many years. My husband gave it to me for my 16th birthday, Dana. Wow. It has broken and I miss it on my finger. You know, when you've worn it for that long, you miss it when yeah, it's not on it's your like finger. It's part of your finger at that point. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, but every time I would look at it, I would remember he gave that to me before we really committed to each other. Mm -hmm. um, that was like his first sign of commitment to me. And I would remember that commitment. And that for me is practicing his presence. I have his picture in the back here, our picture together. It was a happy memory in Mexico. And when I look at it and the beauty of the sunset behind us, it just reminds me of that holiday that we had together. For me, that's practicing the presence of my partner. It starts in my head and then it flows out of my mouth and it can go into my actions then as well. I hope I answered that question to you. No, that's beautiful. It's so you. I love the practice. We talk about practicing the presence of God a lot, um, but I've never right. thought, I've never thought about practicing the presence of my partner. That is a really, really sweet and I think really deep thought. So my second question to that, Anne, was how has God been kind to you? I remembered you asked that question. Didn't you? <laughs> and God, I met him, Jesus Christ, when I was 15 years old. I remember searching the scriptures because, by the way, my dating partner, who was this guy behind me here, Malus, <laughs> he said to me, he wouldn't give me a date because I wasn't a Christian. Oh, Mm -hmm. that's bold, right? Because nowadays it's like, you're not a Christian. No problem. No problem. I like you. You know? Yeah. Good job, husband. <laughs> right. All I wanted was a date. I wasn't thinking any further than a date. And, um, but he, um, he shared, he said, read the Bible. Um, I, I, I started asking him all kinds of questions. He said, read your Bible, start in Matthew. And, and so I started to read and I understood nothing. And I became so frustrated. I got down on my knees and I, and I cried out to God. I was in my dad's barnyard. We, we owned horses and I was in the barnyard and I got on my knees and I said, God, you promised me. This is the only verse I really knew, Dana. I said, you promised me if I would seek you, I would find you. And I'm looking for you and I can't find you. This was the first kindness of God, Dana. It was like he said to me, I am here you are mine and I am yours. And mm. I made you for a purpose and on purpose. It changed everything for me, Dana. I, I raced back to my bedroom. I opened my Bible and it was like the words were jumping off the page. The Holy wow. Spirit was just speaking to me through God's word for, for the very first time. And I recognized that my life had changed forever. Mm -hmm. And that was the first kindness of God. The second kindness was bringing this fella into my life. 
and so many other people uh, who have nurtured that my faith along the way and who have spoken into my life at very pivotal moments and times in my life, who recognized gifts that I didn't even know that I had. That was a great kindness of God. Um, so many ways God has loved me through my husband um, in special moments that we've shared together, even just in the coffee that we shared this morning and prayer time, those are just great kindness of God, mm -hmm. just tiny moments, but then the, the bigger moments too, Dana. That's super sweet. And thank you for sharing that with us. You know, when I think about kindness, if I'm honest, I didn't really grow up in a home where we really ever talked about being kind. It was just kind of, you know, I had a single mom for most of my childhood. And so I think her main goal was like survival, you know, making sure that she had three daughters, making sure that we grew up and we went to school, we got our education and that we survived, you know? Yeah. Um, and she was a good mother. She really was. But I didn't really see a lot of like, you should, your responses should be kind. You know, we grew up being independent and like, you know, learning how to take care of ourselves. And so um, I think about in marriage a lot of times, it's interesting because you're, you specialize in helping women, especially to communicate with clarity, right? And I think sometimes we feel like if we're clear and if we communicate clearly and if we're direct, that somehow that's not being kind. And I do believe that you can be both. I'm learning this in my life. Like I'm extremely direct and I, I thank God he has put a filter on my mouth, you know, because, and I was never like nasty. I wouldn't cuss people out or anything, but I just said what I needed to say. And if you were cut up to shreds, then sorry for you, you know, but I felt better. Like you said, you know, I felt better. Um, and so God is helping me literally in real time to be able to be direct and to be able to communicate clearly, but also to communicate kindly. So how do you help women to do both? How do you help women to say what they mean, mean what they say, but then to temper their words so that they're not cutting their families or husbands up to, into shreds? Mm -hmm. So I teach the three C's of pivotal conversations. And one of the, one of the most important C's of that is to check emotions. The women that I work with are extraordinarily kind and they, um, they struggle with overwhelming emotions. And so one of the things I think is really important for all of us is to check our emotions in the beginning, to check the emotions. Like, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? Well, what's really troubling me? And what is it that I really, really want here? And then the second part of that, Dana, which I think you'll find helpful is to check our motives, mm. to check my intentions. What is my intention here? Because once I check my intentions, it may be not where my emotions were. And so then I can bring my emotions in line with my intentions and where I want to go. You know, the scripture says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I like, I love to ask God, you know, reveal what's inside my heart. What is going on inside my heart? I remember a time when I was sitting at the kitchen table with my oldest daughter and I was talking to her about a conversation I needed to have with our son. It was about setting boundaries. He's an, he was an adult at this time. And I just blurted out to her, I just don't trust him. And my adult daughter looked at me knowing full well, this was not about her brother. This was about me. This was mm. about my heart and some belief that I had going on. And she said, she said to me, mom, that's awful. You got to check that. I knew it as soon as it was out of my mouth, I knew I had a problem. I knew that emotions and motives were a problem here in this, in this, what I was thinking about our son. I ran to what I call my thinking chair, Dana, and I started to journal out. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What is it I want? And I recognize God showed me you're stuck back in 2005 when we had some challenges raising this young man. He wasn't there anymore, but I was there. My emotions were stuck in 2005. If I had had that pivotal conversation before I checked my emotions and my motives, that conversation would not have gone well. I am convinced when you start a conversation thinking I don't trust him, <laughs> when he is trustworthy, by the way, this is not a toxic relationship and he's not toxic. He's a beautiful man, a young man. 
And if I had not checked those, those words that would have come out of my mouth would not have been kind. They would not have been helpful. And I would have sabotaged the conversation before it even started. Mm. And so I encourage my women, check those emotions and check those motives of your heart to see where you are so that you can speak with, you can communicate with clarity and you can communicate in a way that is kind still. Mm -hmm. So we have check your emotions, check your motives. And then there's there a third C. Yes, it's uh, check your check your emotions is number one, then communicate and clarify uh, and then invite communication. So it's a it's a it's not a monologue. It's a dialogue. Right. Yeah. But then the third C is to create we solutions. You know, if I oh, well, just create good. the solution myself, it's not necessarily going to be a we solution. Yeah. And so we want to create a we solution that works for both people. And I like to think about it as, you know, often we see the other person as the enemy mm -hmm. when we need to have a big conversation. But when we see them as the bad guy immediately, that makes me the good girl. Mm. Yeah. And that makes them the enemy. Mm -hmm. That's not a good place to start. I want to see the problem as the problem and see the other person as a part of the solution so that together we can create that we solution that will help us both move forward in what the problem was. Mm -hmm.